So, last time, we were talking about imagination. And now imagination is really the fundamental, basic, most important function of the mind. So, some people don't understand this, huh? <clears throat> and I think it's because of the connotation in the West uh, from materialism that imagination is unreal. Huh? You know how people say, well, it's all in your head, right? It's all in your mind. It's just your imagination. Huh? Or like my friends from Oklahoma <laughs> said, it's just your imaginary mind. Because the mind and imagination are basically equivalent. Or you could say imagination is the function of the mind. This is how the mind works. Huh? <clears throat> but now let's consider some examples of how imagination is central to not only the function of the mind in general, but specifically in spiritual life. <clears throat> let's begin with the concept of faith. What is faith? If you go to your local church, they're going to say, you should believe in Jesus. <laughs> well, maybe they won't say it like that unless you're in the southern United States. But anyway, they mean the same thing. Just believe. Just have faith. Just accept this uh, rather outlandish idea. <laughs> Christianity isn't the only one that asks us to do that. How about the idea of the Big Bang? That suddenly, for no reason at all, everything comes out of nothing. Boom. <laughs> I mean, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. Huh? So... <laughs> If you really want to understand any field, any point of view, any religion, any science, any philosophy, you have to ask, first of all, what are its beliefs? What are the ideas that it wants you to take on faith? Because faith, is actually another word for what the Buddha called fabrication, shankara, huh? fabrications. <clears throat> In the process of paticca samuppada, the process of becoming, the first step is ignorance. The next step is fabrications. And it doesn't make a difference whether you're just trying to, you know, do something in the material world, any perfectly ordinary action, or you're trying to attain self-realization. It doesn't matter. The first step after deciding that it's possible is fabrication. And unless you think that I'm misquoting or misunderstanding the Buddha. What about this sutra where the Buddha admits that the jhanas are fabrications? Fabrications. They're imaginary. Huh? They're only in your imaginary mind. <laughs> so if the jhanas are imaginary, then the whole rest of the Eightfold Path must be. Huh? Because the jhanas represent the last stage 
of right concentration, right meditation. Everything leading up to that is also a fabrication. And what's the first stage of the ascending side of Paticca Samuppada? Well, some people translate it faith. But other people translate it confidence. To have confidence in the teaching of the Buddha. And what gives that confidence? When you try it and it works. So we're not exactly talking about the kind of faith, like blind faith in some absurd idea. But we are talking about, how can I say, accepting a premise and acting on it in order to see whether it's true, whether it's real. Huh? So if you go to any Buddhist temple or if you go to a Buddhist meditation master or teacher, first thing they're going to tell you is sit down and concentrate. Well, why should I do that? Just try it and see is the answer. Try it and see. Have enough faith to follow the instruction and experience the result. Then you can judge whether it's true or not. Actually, the most powerful form of meditation is simply to sit and do nothing. <laughs> watch. Just watch. Stop all activity. Stop all thought. Stop imagining anything. <laughs> and just watch. And you'll be amazed what happens. But you have to really do it. Like when I attained first path in 1984, I sat like that for six weeks. Every day, all day, at least eight hours a day, up to 16. So to simply sit and do nothing with no expectation, no desire, no faith in any particular thing, no imagination, leads to enlightenment, realization. It leads to seeing the reality. Normally, we don't see the reality. Why? It's blocked by our imaginary mind. <laughs> it's blocked by our ideas and concepts, our worldview, our ontology that says that such and such a thing is, is real and these other things are not real. So every religion, every spiritual method involves some kind of imagination, directed imagination toward a particular goal. And that's all right. Why? The whole world is imagination. <laughs> Why is uh, the goddess called Maya, Mother Maya, Maya Devi, the goddess of illusion. Huh? Because she imagines the world and it comes into being. She has a pretty strong imagination. From this imagination, everything manifests. So when we are trying to get out of materially conditioned consciousness and see the reality, one of the things that we have to accept is that any spiritual method or path involves some kind of fabrication, some kind of imagination. That's not a bad thing. Uh, I think if my, if anything, my point here is that just because something exists only in your imagination doesn't mean it's unreal, bad, wrong, or illusory. You can have an imagination of something that's perfectly real. 
But because it exists only as an idea in your mind, materialistically inclined people will judge it as unreal, subjective. See, this is one of the, uh, I talked the other week, last week, about spiritual uh, reductionism. And, and this is a reductionism, this method of reductionism is borrowed from science, or maybe I should say scientism, because it tries to take something that's very complex and nuanced and deep and make it simple, clear, and inevitably shallow. For example, everybody knows Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, right? But how many can explain what it actually means? Very few. Huh? Anybody can quote it, but few people really understand it. And then how many of those could take that equation and use it to design, let's say, a nuclear reactor or a nuclear bomb or something like that? Very, very few. <laughs> and the same is true of spiritual life. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Manushyanam Sahasranam, out of thousands and thousands of men, only one can understand this philosophy. And out of thousands and thousands who understand, only one has realized it in truth. So this is the reason that we have this bias, this prejudice of scientism that objective things only are real and the subjective world, the world within, is a simply imagination. Well, it's not that simple, Mr. Scientist, because the perceptions that you base your theories on are also in your mind. And your whole theory-making machine is also in your mind. And even the perceptions, the sense perceptions that led up to your theory are also simply impressions in the mind. Basically, imaginary. So imagination is not a bad thing. Imagination is very creative. It's really how we live our lives, how we lead our lives to the direction that we want to go. The style or the image that we want to grow into is something we hold in our mind. So one of the most important aspects of spiritual life then is changing the contents or the direction of that imagination to uh, match the actual spiritual reality. So in the beginning, there are so many things, uh, processes, sacrifices, rituals, and so on that you must do simply to clean up your karma. Uh, that's karma yoga. Then you get to bhakti yoga. And in bhakti yoga, you have to choose a deity, an ishta devata, the one God that you worship above all others. All gods should be respected. Uh, but even the forms of the gods are basically imaginary. And that's okay. See, for example, in the commentary on Nalita Sahasranama, it's stated that uh, Lalita, Devi, the goddess, the mother, doesn't like to appear in physical form, a visible form, because her nature is that she is consciousness 
and consciousness is completely subjective. Huh? You cannot see consciousness. You can only be consciousness. You cannot see the self. You can only be the self. That's a famous saying of Ramana Maharshi. So imagination is not a bad thing. Imagination is how we create our future. Even the scientists who put down the subjective world have to think up their theories and design their experiments in their imagination. They will model whatever thing they're investigating and use their internal subjective model to create an experiment that will prove or disprove whatever hypothesis they're testing. So even in science, imagination is crucial. Faith is crucial. Fabrication is crucial. And what to speak of how we attain our next body. Most people aren't thinking about their next life at all. They're completely up to here with just dealing with this life. But that's because they don't realize the importance of it. You know, like, Sometimes people will advise you to save money. And they'll say, well, if you save, you know, $10 a week at compound interest from the time you're 10 years old, you'll have enough to pay for college by the time you're 20. So I don't know if those numbers are right, you know, but the principle is there. If you save a little bit at a time and then simply wait for the interest to build, you wind up with far more than you put in to your savings. And the same is true of becoming who you're going to be in the next life. You should have a clear idea. First of all, you should have a god or goddess to worship. And the aim of bhakti yoga then is to go to the planet or the world or the realm or the state of that god or goddess, the Ishta Devata. So this is what all serious yogis are involved in. Why they're chanting mantras, why they're doing pujas, why they're taking on so many austerities, tapasya, and this is the actual process. This is the actual means of attaining the desired state in the next life. And this is called rasa bhava. And we made a series on that too. I'm not really happy with that series, but it's an introduction at least. And what it does is cultivates a mood in relation with your ishta devata and certain pastimes, the activities that you have between you. I don't know why it's so hard for most people to choose both the Ishta Devata and the Rasa or the mood. And there are five principal moods, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. These are the five principal rasas. And your relationship with your Ishta Devata is going to be based on one of those. And then the moksha, the liberation that you attain, is also going to be based on these five. Now, there are five kinds of liberation. It's another video that we made. So imagination or fabrication or faith is an indispensable part even of ordinary life. Huh? What do you want to be when you grow up? Everybody asks you that when you're a kid. So you're imagining yourself, you're playing as a fireman or an astronaut or a hacker. I guess that's a new one these days for kids. 
<laughs> I want to be a hacker when I grow up. But without that imagination, we're going to be simply thrown around by the waves of the material world and unable to attain our real desired goal of life. Aung Tatsun. Aung Shakti Aung.